you have your Bibles, I'm going to encourage you at this time to turn to Matthew's Gospel. We are in chapter 24, and we're going to pick it up where we left off last week, and that's in verse 36. And Lord willing, we'll make it all the way to verse 44. Today we're uh, getting closer to finishing the chapter. It's only taken a couple of months, but uh, we're, <laughs> we're getting there. Uh, so Matthew chapter 24, if you need a Bible, there used to be Bibles <laughs> on the information table next to the CDs that used to be there as well. So, uh, would you, can I trouble you to stand and you can follow along with me as I read our text today. Okay. Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. Jesus is speaking. Matthew is recording. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven or the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Verse 40. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Would you join with me in a word of prayer? Father, we are needing for you, by your Holy Spirit, to give us eyes to see that which you desire to show us from the scriptures today. We need for you to give us understanding and bless the application of this to our hearts, the understanding of it to our minds. Lord, we invite you at this time to minister to us through the teaching of your word, as your Holy Spirit teaches us and ministers to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. And you may be seated. This is part six of a study entitled, The End of the World. It all started at the beginning of Matthew 24, when Jesus was asked by his disciples, what will be the sign of your coming, the sign of the end of the age, or the end of the world? And then Jesus, in response to the disciples' question, sort of goes through this list of things that will be present just before his return, some many years later. And so as we've been looking at this teaching, we're seeing how that Many of the things that Jesus described and listed for us in Matthew 24 are indeed taking place right before our very eyes, just as almost 2,000 years ago he said would take place. I have sort of organized our uh, study into three different sections. First, the study of the prophetic information, and then second, the understanding of its personal application to our lives. And then thirdly, the urgency of the needed invitation. Let's start with the prophetic information that Matthew records for us and that we have here in our text, starting with first verses 36 through 41. We do not know the day or the hour. We cannot know the day or the hour that Jesus comes. In verse 36, he declares that no one knows the day or the hour, not even the angels, nor the Son, but only the Father. 
And then in verse 37, he goes on to say that the world will be like it was back in Noah's day when he returns. We'll take a look at that in a little bit more detail here in just a moment. In verse 38, Jesus describes sort of what it was like in the days of Noah, how that people just lived their lives, and it was, for the most part, just business as usual, right up to the day that Noah entered the ark, and then it was too late. In verse 39, they knew nothing about the day or the hour that the flood would come, and then the flood did come. And Jesus says that's how it's going to be before he comes. And then in verse 40 and 41, he gives more detail and says people will be going about their day. He describes how that they'll be eating, drinking, partying like there's no tomorrow, that they'll be you know, giving in marriage. It'll just be life as usual and people will be going about the cares and the affairs of this life, going about their business as if nothing were coming and nothing was happening. Now, this is really a controversial uh, passage of Scripture. I've taught Matthew 24 many times before. I've talked with many whom I would deem to be Bible scholars about Matthew 24, and I've heard the best Bible teachers in the land teach Matthew 24 and even its parallel passage in Luke's Gospel, chapter 21. I've heard different teachings from the same text, and there are many misunderstandings about the events that Jesus describes here, particularly in the passages that we just read. Now, heretofore, he's just finished describing events that would take place during the time called in the Bible, Jacob's trouble, that seven year period called the seven year tribulation. But now, it seems like he's talking about something else entirely different. Now, when he, if you were here last week, was describing what would take place after the event called the abomination that causes desolation, he identified the exact day that it would be 1,290 days after the abomination that causes desolation, according to Daniel 12, verse 11. This has confused a lot of people. What, on the one hand, is he saying here? And what is the question here? How can the day and the hour of Jesus' coming be both known and unknown at the same time. I mean, he just got done saying that there will be 1,290 days, the last three and a half years of the seven-year tribulation where quite literally all hell breaks loose. But then he goes right on to say, almost seemingly contradicting himself, saying, but yet no man knows the day or the hour. Well, which is it? He just told us that we can know the day down to the day. And now he's telling us that we can't know the day we not only cannot know the day, we cannot know the hour. Well, the answer is quite frankly, quite simply, that he is describing two different events. One is the rapture, and one is the second coming. And seven years separates the rapture of the church, where the saints, those born again of the Spirit of God, are caught up and taken to heaven, and then the world will go through this seven-year period, again called the seven-year tribulation. Because see, he's talking about in the context of the rapture that it will be unknown and unexpected. But in the context of the second coming, he's saying that it will be 1,290 days after the abomination that causes desolation. In the context of the rapture, it catches people off guard. It's business as usual. Uh, whereas in the second coming, there's worldwide cataclysmic events, such as Jesus said in Matthew 24, had never been seen in the world before, nor would ever be seen in the world ever again. Well, again, the answer is both. And that explains really the contrast 
in the circumstances surrounding these two different descriptions that Jesus gives us because they are two separate events. If at any time anyone takes the rapture and puts it anywhere but at the beginning and before the seven-year tribulation, not only do they err, but then they take Matthew chapter 24 and they twist it into what I like to call a prophetic pretzel. Let me go again on record and say this. The rapture of the church of Jesus Christ will take place before the seven-year tribulation. Then, at the end of the seven-year tribulation is the second coming of Jesus Christ. At the rapture, Jesus comes for us. At the second coming, he comes with us. The purpose of the seven-year tribulation is not for the church. The purpose of the seven-year tribulation is for the salvation of the Jewish nation. There was like four of you that were <laughs> with me on that. <laughs> The purpose of the tribulation is for the salvation of the Jewish nation. So the seven-year the seven tribulation separates these two events. The rapture and the second coming are like bookends on the seven-year tribulation. So now Jesus is describing events surrounding the rapture of the church. And he likens it unto the days of Noah. This is absolutely fascinating. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but some Bible scholars have estimated that the population of the earth in Noah's day was approximately 6 billion to 9 billion people. In October of 1999, the current population of planet Earth reached approximately 6 billion people. Now, if you go online, there are these world population clocks that you can actually see about three people per second being added to the world's population. Here we are in the year 2006, and the last time I checked it, it came in at approximately 6.7 billion people. So as in the days of Noah, the population of planet Earth would be approximately the same. And currently, it is. This is a chart, actually, world population since the creation and before the flood in the days of Noah and what it is today. And it is like it was in the days of Noah. Also, another really interesting uh, fact, and this is fact, and by the way, let me parenthetically say, again, never take my word for it. And when you're communicating with other people about what we study in God's Word on Sunday mornings here at church, never say to them, well, this is uh, true or this is fact because my pastor said so. No. <laughs> I encourage you to be a Berean do your research. You can go online, Google search all of this that I'm sharing with you today and find the documentation that, that documents these as facts. Hale.com, how many of you remember about 10 years ago, 1997, Hale.com came closest to planet Earth. Well, some astronomers have carefully calculated the comet's orbit and have determined that it last entered our solar system approximately 4,200 years ago, right at the time and in the days of Noah and the flood. Uh, another uh, source, Astronomy Magazine in February of 1997, according to traditional sources, a new star appeared in the sky 4,100 years ago. That was the year the world was destroyed by a flood in the time of Noah. Uh, by the way, all world religions uh, acknowledge a global flood. Did you know that? Are you aware of that? Every world religion and all of the planet has the marks of a global flood. Noah's flood is not in any dispute. It is a fact. 
Well, this star, apparently a comet, traveled through all the constellations in a month's time. It was an omen for the people in the world to reconsider their wicked lifestyles and practices. Interestingly, NASA reports that hale bopp last appeared about 4,200 years ago. And if you go back biblically and chronologically, you can find that the last time this comet came as close to planet Earth was right before the world was destroyed by a flood in the days of Noah. You know what I like about God's Word, church? God says it, and that settles it. God says what's going to happen before it happens, so when it happens, we will know that He is God. Let's look more closely at some more comparisons to what Jesus said it would be like. Not only would the population be the same as it was in the days of Noah, but in Genesis 6, 5, it says people were engaged in the cares and the affairs of this life, and they were more concerned with eating and drinking and being happy. They were going about business as usual. And that's much like it is today. People are engaged in all sorts of activities, caught up in the cares and the affairs. Let's be honest, subsequent to September 11th of 2001, I mean, it's been, what, five years now? And it is business as usual. Now, in the days of Noah, according to Genesis 6-2, there was demonic and very sexually aberrant behavior, and it was the norm of that day. It would be safe to say that in the days of Noah they called evil good and they called good evil. Well, in the year 2006, homosexual marriage and sexual aberrance are fast becoming the norm in our day. They're calling evil good and they're calling good evil. In Noah's day, it says in Genesis 6 5 that man's wickedness had become so vast and that the inclination of the thoughts of the heart of man was only always evil continually. In other words, they would use their imagination to manufacture the most horrific and unthinkable evil known to man. And much like it is today, man's wickedness is on a global scale so vast is the evil of this generation I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure it out. Just pick up the newspaper and you see the evil that is ever so prevalent and ever so present in our day today. And it's just exactly as Jesus said it would be. As in the days of Noah, so too will it be in the days in the coming of the Son of Man. Noah preached while he prepared the ark. And people were warned, but no one would listen. Jesus is being preached while a place is being prepared. And people are being warned. But really, are they listening? I don't think they are. I think people are too concerned about Brad Pitt and his wife and his baby. <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting, and I... I I was shocked, you know, when this thing in the Middle East uh, started. And I was, you know, I don't have Fox News, and we do get the, the newspaper, but, uh, you know, I was, I was just astonished. Uh, I don't know if it's just Hawaii or what, but on the front page of the paper, uh, you know, was a, a picture of Michelle Wee. She had heat stroke. Uh, you know, I, if you're a Michelle Wee fan, I, I don't fault you for that. I just, you know, we're more concerned about Michelle Wee, you know, than we are about what's taking place in the Middle East. Shame on us. Shame on us. They knew nothing about what was going to happen until it was too late. They just went on with the, their daily lives, and then the flood came. People know nothing about what's going to happen. And, and they, they, you see, the world in Noah's day had never seen rain. And in our day, I mean, when you, when you talk about the coming of the Lord, I mean, people scoff and they ridicule and they mock. And it's just 
business as usual, but it's coming. Instead of a flood destroying the world, the, the fire is going to destroy this world. In the days of Noah, right before the destruction of the flood, there was a man by the name of Enoch. It says in Genesis 5.24 that Enoch walked with the Lord and then was no more. He was raptured. He was caught up. He was taken away. Now there is in Bible study this uh, thing called typology where there's a, a picture in the scripture that points to, as a sign, a destination. And that's what really all the feasts were for the nation of Israel. They all pointed to the person of Jesus Christ and his first and second coming. And even the rapture is, is a, in typology uh, with the Feast of Trumpets. And if you look at it, maybe we will, Lord willing, really look at these feasts of Israel and how they tell a prophetic picture and how the rapture is, you know, before the tribulation. Well, Enoch is a picture of the church. And right before the flood, he was raptured and taken away, but Noah and his family, a picture of the Jewish nation, went into this tribulation known as the flood, and they made it through it. And that is exactly how it's going to be for us. You know, people say, well, Noah and his family went through the flood, so the church is going to go through the tribulation. No. Noah is a picture of the nation of Israel. And his family survived the flood and are saved by the ark, which is their salvation, in the flood. And they make it through to the end of the flood and they enter a new earth, just as the Jews will survive the tribulation, and after the judgment will enter into the new heaven and the new earth. Do you know that all through the scriptures, it's not just Enoch and Noah, but all through the scriptures who have pictures of the rapture of the church? Here's another one, just to sort of whet your appetite for those of you who are interested in typology in the scriptures. How about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They go through the seven times hotter fiery furnace. And they find the Lord in the fire, in the furnace, in the seven-year tribulation furnace. Where's Daniel? Conspicuously absent. Church, Daniel is a picture of the church. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are a picture as Jewish Hebrew slaves, a picture in typology of the Jews. They go through the tribulation. Why? Because the purpose of the tribulation. <laughs> See, the church will not go through the seven-year tribulation. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying that the condition on planet Earth will be like it was in the days of Noah. And I submit to you, as I look about the world around me, I come to the conclusion unmistakably that we are living in a day that resembles the day of Noah. Well, our personal application is found really in the remaining verses 42 through 44. Whenever you see a therefore in Scripture, you can know what it's there for. <laughs> therefore is therefore because everything that Jesus said heretofore is for the therefore. In other words, here's the prophetic information. Now here's what you need to do by way of personal application. Because again, knowledge is just information. But wisdom is the application of that information. Jesus says we have to keep watching. In verse 42, he says that we need to keep watching because we don't know the day or the hour of the rapture of the church. We do know the day of the second coming. Every eye will see him. It will not come as a thief in the night and catch people off guard. The second coming of Jesus Christ is an event that everyone will know and everyone will see. Make no mistake about that. Different with the rapture. 
in verse 43. He illustrates this by comparing it to one not knowing at what time a thief would come. If he's watching, he won't be caught off guard. But you have to keep watching. Are you watching here this morning? Are you watching the news here this morning? Are you watching for the return of Jesus Christ for his church here this morning? If you are not, then Jesus says you will be caught off guard and it will surprise you as a thief in the night. And so he says in verse 42, uh, 44, so too must we always be ready because Jesus will come to rapture his bride, his church, at an hour that we would not expect him to do it. Now when I say to you what Jesus is saying to us, I'm going to come, he says, at an hour that you do not expect. How many of us, if the truth be known, could honestly say that we really expect Jesus to come and rapture us at this hour. I think if we were really honest, that's not really true. And I'll tell you why I say that. Because if that were true, it would have a profound impact. And I include myself in this. If it were really true that we really believe that Jesus could come back at any hour how would that change the complexion of how we live our lives today? How would that change the schedule that we have for the upcoming week? If we really believe that Jesus could come at any hour, I think it would change what we did not only this afternoon, but what we did this week, whom we talked to, and what we talked to them about. I'm not so sure we wouldn't cancel some things already on our calendars. In the light of the imminent return at any minute, at any hour of the Lord. I want to round the corner. And I have to say, as much as I love teaching Bible prophecy, this has probably been one of the most difficult uh, teachings that I've ever prepared for on a Sunday morning. I asked myself and I inquired of the Lord, Lord, how specifically do we keep watching so that we're ready, so that we're not caught off guard and your return at the rapture takes us by surprise at an hour that we don't expect it like a thief in the night. And in the context of Matthew 24, I think is the answer to that question. The context of Matthew 24 is watch Israel. It's been said that if you want to know what time it is on God's prophetic clock, look at the nation Israel. Isn't that what he said when he said, when you see the leaves and the figs return to the tree, the leaves and the figs being Israel return to the land? That generation will be the generation that sees the coming of the Son of Man. In other words, he's qualifying it. He's putting a timeline, if you will. And even though we don't know the day or the hour, we can know that it's soon. And we need to be watching and waiting. I have been watching with great interest the news in the Middle East, as I know many of you have as well. And as we talked about last week, I'm going to go on record and tell you that I believe that what is happening in the Middle East right now is very likely to be the fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy with the surrounding nations, namely Lebanon and Syria. And let's not forget about the prophecy in Isaiah 17, that Damascus, the city of Damascus, will become a ruinous heap in one day. This is, God's got a pretty good track record as far as I'm concerned as it relates to prophecy in the scripture. First of all, Damascus would have to exist as a city and Syria as a nation in order for that prophecy to be fulfilled. And heretofore it's not been fulfilled. 
I submit to you that it looks to me like it's about to be fulfilled. And conspicuously absent from another very important prophecy in Ezekiel 38 are the nations Syria and Lebanon and Egypt and Jordan, who both have, and as the only two Arab nations, to have peace agreements with Israel. And more interestingly, Iraq. All of which, as Muslims, would for sure be in this alliance of nations from which the common denominator we find to be Islam. So I believe that prophecy is being fulfilled. And I believe when Jesus says that we need to be watching, I believe he's saying, watch what's happening with those fig leaves that have returned to the tree. Watch what's happening with Israel that's returned to the land as a nation. Watch what's happening. And because if you watch, then you will know that the coming is close and it won't catch you off guard. I do not want for us as a church to be caught off guard by the rapture. Now I'm going to make a statement. Here it is again. <laughs> there is nothing that has yet to happen prophetically before the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. It could happen at any time. Now there are many things that need to happen before the second coming. The Antichrist has to be revealed, number one. Did you know that according to 1 Thessalonians, the Antichrist cannot be revealed until the church is removed? But do you know that he's probably on the scene today, alive and well, already functioning, but you haven't heard much about him because it's not his time to be revealed. Now, if you remember at the beginning of our study in Matthew 24, Jesus said that there will be wars and rumors of wars, that nation will rise up against nation, and there will be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in various places. And he said that these will be the beginning of birth pains. Interesting, uh, I watch uh, C-SPAN, and Fox News uh, recorded the Condoleezza Rice uh, address, deal with questions, and she said, quote, we are seeing the birth pains of the new Middle East. What do we know about birth pains? They come in shorter frequency and greater intensity. I thought it was interesting that this uh, article, which was on Saturday the 15th of July, from Ynet News, Israel gives Syria ultimatum. The London-based Arabic language newspaper Al Hayat reported Saturday that Washington has information according to which Israel gave Damascus 72 hours to stop Hezbollah's activity along the Lebanon-Israel border and bring about the release of two kidnapped IDF soldiers or it would launch an offensive with disastrous consequences. Report said a senior Pentagon source warned that should the Arab world and international community fail in the efforts to convince Syria to pressure Hezbollah into releasing the soldiers and halt the current escalation, Israel may attack targets in the country. What country? Syria, Damascus, Isaiah 17 1. Church, listen, are you watching? Don't let what I believe is about to happen catch you off guard. Here's another interesting one. Yahu Olmert, the uh, uh, Prime Minister of Israel. Again, Fox News. Quote, we seek a covenant of peace. Oh, a covenant of peace? Church, this is Daniel 9.27. The Antichrist will come on the scene, and it says in Daniel 9.27 that he will confirm a covenant for seven years with Israel so that Israel and the Palestinians can have two states living side by side in, quote, peace and security. And if you were with us in that study, 
1 Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul by the Holy Spirit said, when they say peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as a woman giving birth with labor pains. Again, it's exactly what Jesus said. Well, then there's this article that appeared in the Jerusalem Post on Monday the 17th. Almer hopes for eternal covenant with Arabs. Prime Minister Ahmed Almer said Monday that he hoped an eternal covenant could soon be signed between Israel and its, what is this word with me? It's Zechariah 12 in the Hebrew, it's Sabib. In the English, it's neighbors. Neighbors. Israel didn't want these confrontations. On the contrary, we did our utmost to avoid them by withdrawing to borders recognized by the international community, said the Prime Minister. Olmert added that Israel had no business in involving itself with the internal struggles within Lebanon and the Palestinian Authority, adding, our problem is with the terrorists attacking us from those territories. When I look through and study the Word of God, I find that there's a really simple timeline that describes for us what's going to happen before Jesus comes. First of all, Israel would have to come back as a nation, 1948. Then they would have to have Jerusalem, 1967. That's Zechariah 12. And that Jerusalem would become this intoxication, this cup of intoxication to the surrounding nations. And it would be an immovable stone. In other words, you cannot move the boundary stones. Don't move the boundaries of Jerusalem and try to create two states there. Now, the Bible describes that there will come on the scene one who will do what no one heretofore has ever been able to do, and that's to bring about peace finally to the Middle East. To bring Arab and Jew together in peace and security. And the first three and a half years of the tribulation are going to be very peaceful. It's going to be a pseudo peace. It's going to be a false peace because it's been orchestrated by and confirmed by the false Christ, the false Messiah, whom the world will worship and hail because he was able to do what no one was ever able to do. The general consensus amongst those world leaders, and even as it was echoed by Condoleezza Rice uh, this last uh, week, was that she's on her way, actually, as we speak to the Middle East, and she has made it very clear that she's not after a ceasefire. Why? Because it would just be a thing where they would find themselves back in uh, back at the table in six months, and it would it's, what they're looking for is lasting peace or quote an eternal covenant. In other words, stopping this uh, Lebanon Syria Israel war will not bring about the peace that the Bible describes will be brought about. I believe it is the catalyst that will bring about this peace agreement. I could be wrong, but I believe that Israel will vis-a-vis -vis Lebanon destroy Damascus. Make no mistake about it, militarily they can do it before lunch with their eyes closed. It's a slammed up militarily, they have the capability of doing it, and they probably will have to do it. Do you think Hezbollah is going to release the soldiers? You think they're going to go, oh, our bad, sorry, we'll stop. Firing the Iranian rockets into Israel. What were we thinking? I don't think so. Now, I'm about to introduce you to a man that has been just recently in the news, but not on your television screen. You can do a Google search, maybe you've heard of him, maybe you haven't. His name, Javier Solana. This is a very powerful man. 
some believe is the most powerful man in Europe, out of the European Empire. He's uh, on the world scene, has been. You've not seen him. You've not heard much about him. Uh, he's currently the European Union's High Representative for the Common Foreign and Security Policy and the Secretary General of both the Council of the European Union, or the EU, and the Western European Union, the WEU. He is more powerful than the President of the EU. He is more powerful than Kofi Annan of the United Nations. He is more powerful than George W. Bush, the President of the United States. It's interesting. The Western European Union. In 1995, Mr. Salon became the Secretary General of the Ten Nation Alliance known as the Western European Union, aka the WEU. There are ten nations, only ten, that are categorized and classified as full nation status. Ten of them. And he is at the helm, he is the chief. And just recently, in fact, just in the past month, he announced the formation of a seven-year covenant to promote peace and security for Israel and the Middle East. Quote, I am pleased that the EU will launch a so-called governance facility. This will not be a cosmetic initiative, but one that over seven years, not eight, not six, seven. What a coincidence. Wow, this is amazing. Over seven years will offer several hundred million euros to those countries that are making the greatest efforts concerning governance reform. Moreover, it goes on to say, he goes on to say, quote, we Europeans have been working nonstop to promote a peace and security reform to go hand in hand. Now, it's really interesting because you got three indisputable facts. First, there's now a 10 nation military coalition called the Western European Union. Then you have a seven year period being specifically discussed, as we've just seen with the quote from Salon. And it's also interesting to note that there's this European neighborhood policy known as the EMP. And this is a document which puts Dr. Javier Solana in place as high representative. And this document is known as recommendation number 666. And it was accepted on June 5th of the year 2000 in the 46th session of the Western European Union. Now, how can we have not heard of him? Again, the Antichrist cannot be revealed until the church is removed. Am I saying Javier Salon is the Antichrist? I'm not. I'm not saying he is. I'm not saying he isn't. I just want to present to you some of the research that I think is apropos for our study of Matthew 24 when Jesus says to be watching. Now, I'm not watching for the Antichrist. I'm watching for Jesus Christ. But I know that if the Antichrist cannot be revealed before Jesus Christ comes for his church, and the Antichrist is already on the scene, that means that Jesus is coming for us soon. And I don't want to be caught off guard. And that's what I believe Jesus is saying when he says, Watch. Watch the news. Watch the WEU. Watch Javier Solana. I've got uh, pictures of him with every world leader on the planet. He's been behind the scenes for years, putting together his initiative, his plan, his peace plan. If it's not him, I believe without question that he is posturing and positioning the one that will come after him, that will be the one that will be the chief or the head of this ten nation alliance. And this man, as Daniel says, will do exactly what he's already got the groundwork and the foundation and is doing. It is amazing. And you don't see him on the news. 
They don't put them on the news. I don't know why. It's interesting. Some of the I, I, by the way, I get this off the internet. And I listen. I'm no smarter than anybody else. <laughs> I'm sorry, we, our 20 minutes is up. <laughs> okay, 45 minutes. Well, we're, we're almost done. This from Hurriyet, uh, EU Foreign Policy Chief Javier Solana in Lebanon. This was on Wednesday the 19th. The head of foreign policy for the EU, Representative Javier Solana, has gone to Lebanon to show solidarity and support for the country. Solana's spokesperson has said that Solana carried messages of support to the Lebanese people on his visit and that there will be a meeting today in Brussels of the EU foreign ministers in which Solana will brief them on information gathered during his trip. This from People's Daily Online. Notice this is astonishing to me. The headline reads, Solana promises to end Middle East bloodshed as soon as possible. Call me silly, but that seems to me to be a pretty tall order, don't you think? This was Thursday the 20th. The European Union Foreign Policy Chief Javier Solana said Wednesday that the EU, along with the concerned parties, would try its best to end the current crisis in the Middle East as soon as possible. This on uh, Saturday the 15th. EU preparing new package for Iran. Who's preparing it and who's preparing it? Pre presenting it, Javier Salam. Salam. Diplomat Javier Salam has said that the European Union is preparing a new package of measures as it attempts to convince Iran to curb its nuclear ambitions. Uh, interesting to note that he presented it on the 6th of June, 2006. I, I, I don't, I don't make this stuff up, okay? It just, that's what, this is, I just copied off the internet. 666, on June 6, he went to Iran and presented his plan, his package. <laughs> EU Foreign Policy Chief Javier Salana will present Iran on Tuesday with proposals from six world, po six world powers aimed at persuading it to rein in a nuclear program the West fears will lead to building atomic bombs. I, again, please understand that, that Lebanon is a puppet government. Hezbollah is the finger and uh, Syria the hand, but Iran is the arm. This is not about Lebanon. This is not about even so much Syria as much as it is about Iran. And isn't it interesting again that Iran and Russia are the forerunners in the Ezekiel 38 prophecy of nations that will rise up and attack Israel? This is an interesting in fact. This was just on the uh, 20th. And again, you, you didn't see this anywhere uh, on the news, I got it off the internet, uh, from China View. <laughs> Anan, Kofi Anan, to meet Rice Solana on Mideast crisis. Notice this. U.S. Secretary General Kofi Annan is scheduled to meet U.S. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice and EU Foreign Policy Chief Javier Solana on Thursday, so just this last Thursday, in New York to discuss the situation in the Middle East UN Deputy Secretary General Mark Malach Brown announced Wednesday it will be a private dinner, <coughs> Brown told reporters at UN headquarters in New York. Interesting. One last article. He even went to meet Israeli families of the captured soldiers. This guy gets around. He's uh, got an agenda, you might say. Uh, he uh, yesterday met the families of the three captured Israeli soldiers, promising again to help free them. Listen, church, I don't mean to create a sensationalism. I, I inquired of the Lord this last week, do I need to include this in the teaching on Sunday? And you know, I hesitated because I don't want to be that nutty, off-the-wall kook, you know, you'll see me down in the corner of uh, Camp Highway and Mahi Nui with a, you know, sandwich board sign, you know, REPENT! <laughs> 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 By 
By the way, if you do see me, uh, you wait at least a hundred percent. But uh, I don't want to because I think that we, I think that, that Christianity related to this has a black eye of sorts, like getting all worked up and getting people all worked up. You know, hey, it's, he's the antichrist. I mean, everybody's been the antichrist. I think Barney was the antichrist for a while, wasn't he? And I don't want to do that, and I hesitated in bringing this today because of that, but I, I believe that it was incumbent on me to share with you what I've been watching and what I've been seeing. And if you have an interest in pursuing this, I would encourage you to make your own personal study of this. I believe that the return of the Lord for his church is at any time. The Apostle Peter said, if this is true, how then ought we to live? And that the one who has this hope of his imminent return purifies us. In other words, gets his affairs in order. It's akin to going into the doctor and the doctor saying, you know, you've only got a few more weeks to live. You might want to get your affairs in order. I'm not saying you have a few more weeks, but Jesus said, I will come at an hour that you do not expect. And lest that catch you off guard and take you by surprise, Keep watching and keep looking specifically at what's taking place in the Middle East so that when it happens, it will not catch you off guard. And listen, it has a way of really prioritizing the cares and affairs of this life, doesn't it? I mean, just in this last week of study, (laughs) preparing for this study, I started looking at some of the things that I have on my calendar and I think, why? You know, occupy till he comes, but hold on loosely to those plans. Because again, I believe he can come at any time. Listen, if you're here today, perhaps you're not walking with the Lord. Maybe you know the Lord mentally, but you don't know the Lord in your heart. Maybe you know the Bible, but you don't know the Lord or the God of the Bible person. Maybe you're here today and you've kind of been backslidden and all caught up in the cares and the affairs of this life. The needed invitation and the urgency that is before us in the clarion call is we need to do business with God. We're all sinners saved by grace. He's the Savior. All through the scriptures, the message is simple. The bad news is we're all sinners. The good news is he's the Savior. That's what the gospel is. And he came to bridge that gap that sin created when sin entered the world so that God, through Jesus Christ, could reconcile us to himself. If you're here today, I... I really encourage you, if you've got some unfinished business with the Lord, to not leave him until you do what I believe the Lord has been impressing on your heart to do. Perhaps you're here and it's just been business as usual. I mean, you'll come to church on a Sunday and that alarm clock goes off on Monday morning and oh, I hope. So off to work I go, and then you just kind of come back on Sunday and go back to work on Monday and come back to church on Sunday and go back to work on Monday. And, and uh, you know, I was driving in the car the other day and, and uh, I was just noticing people just going to and fro, like Daniel says. And I just, I just wanted to yell, do you guys know what's happening? <laughs> and then they would have thought I was a nut. I thought, Lord, how do you communicate this to people? And I believe that it's one person at a time, eyeball to eyeball, that you will perhaps cross paths with somebody this week that God has scheduled an appointment with you, with them. And it's going to be for such a time as this that you're going to communicate to them the hope that is within you so that you can give to everyone that God brings into your path and answer. The end is not just near, the end is here. As I watch, as I see everything take place that Jesus said would take place, 
Is it like it was in the days of Noah? Absolutely. Are we to keep watching so it doesn't catch us off guard? Absolutely. What should that do? It should change the very fabric of who we are so that it can ready us and steady us for that which is being prepared for us. 